This episode was suggested by Basic Nature Witch. If you'd like to suggest an episode, you can do so on Facebook and Instagram at Morbid Curiosity Podcast, on Twitter at Morbid Podcast, and on our website, www.morbidcuriositypodcast.com. This episode contains discussions of violent colonization, racism, animal attacks, descriptions of mauled human remains, and big game hunting. If these aren't something you want to hear about, this may be a good episode to skip. Humans are fascinated by gore and violence, but even more so the mysterious and unsolved. Interest in these disturbing and unpleasant subjects is called morbid curiosity, and it has gripped millions of people throughout the ages. I am one of those people. My name is Hallie, and this is the Morbid Curiosity Podcast. It may not be common knowledge that most carnivorous animals don't usually hunt humans. However, this is true. Humans aren't generally the target or prey of hungry carnivores. We frighten them with our lights, our sounds, and our weapons. But still, we fear them. We know they could easily kill us with their superior strength and inbuilt weapons like claws and teeth. Sometimes large carnivores do kill and eat humans. We in Western countries don't often hear about it, as it usually occurs in rural areas where modern technology and security are not the norm. When a rare, extreme case does happen, thanks to the internet, it makes international news. One instance made international news at a time when the internet wasn't even a dream. This instance involved two man-eating lions in the Savo region of Kenya. The nine-month-long saga occurred in 1898 during construction of a British railway line from the Indian Ocean coast of Kenya to Lake Victoria. Most of the deaths occurred during bridge construction at the Savo River, where two male lions without manes started systematically hunting and killing the Indian workers during the night. The lions were so stealthy and so coordinated that the workers began to refer to them as devils and demons. Before I go into detail, some context is required. Much of the early history of what is now Kenya is unknown. Unfortunately, there isn't any written documentation from the indigenous peoples, which creates cultural bias in the information we do have, as it's from outside and colonial sources. International interest in the region began when Arabic merchants established trading posts on the coast during the 7th century CE. During the medieval period, the area was part of the Swahili coast, a network of trading towns that integrated local African culture and Arabic traditions. You can learn more about the Swahili coast in our episode, Ghost in the Ruins, which talks about the mysterious ruins of Gedi. The Portuguese took control of coastal trading in the early 16th century, before Arabic merchants resumed control by 1720. Around 1750, the Maasai, a nomadic people whose way of life centered on cattle herding, entered the area from the north and moved south. At the end of the 1850s, the Maasai were recorded by the coast near what is now Mombasa. At the time, the coast of Kenya was under the dominion of the Omani Empire, a maritime empire based in Oman. In 1856, the coastal area became part of the Sultanate of Zanzibar, an offshoot of the Omani Empire. During the 1860s, the Maasai successfully prevented European attempts to penetrate the interior of the country. However, due to two outbreaks of cattle disease and an outbreak of smallpox in the 1880s, the Maasai were unable to deter European powers in the 1890s. East Africa became an expansion battleground, with multiple countries trying to lay claims and control trade routes. The British looked at the area as a stop along their trade routes to India, which was already colonized at this point. In 1885, the Sultan of Zanzibar granted the British a 50-year concession on the African mainland north of the Umba River, roughly the southern border of what is now Kenya. 
This claim included the rich and fertile lake region of the country. The British East Africa Company, a commercial trade association, was granted a charter in 1888 to begin British colonization of the area. When the company went bankrupt, the British government took over, intending to use the colony as a gateway to the mineral mines of Uganda, Buganda, and Banyoro. British authorities forcibly took land, introduced forced labor through taxation, and basically ensured the indigenous peoples became subjects of the British settlers. To pay for the colony, nature safaris and commercial big game hunting were established to draw in rich Europeans. The goal of the Uganda-Mombasa Railway was to replace long-standing Arabic and Swahili trade caravans and gain access to the interior of the country. The cost of construction was high. Draft animals died in the heat, so moving any supplies for building was slow and difficult. Water was scarce along the route, with Savo being one of three places to get it, and disease from the blood-sucking tsetse flies was rampant. Massive immigration ensued when outside labor and artisans were brought in from colonial India to lay the groundworks for the rail. 4,000 people arrived in 1896. Immigration slowed from April 1896 to September 1897 due to the third plague pandemic, which you can hear about in our previous episode on the topic. By 1899, there were around 18,000 Indian workers. Indians outnumbered whites two to one, and the Indian rupee was Kenya's main currency. The Savo River was about three quarters of the way along the line to Mombasa from Lake Victoria. Savo means place of slaughter in Kikamba, the language of the Kamba or Akamba people. It references past Maasai raids that swept the area and many mysterious disappearances that seemed to occur around the river. Tales circulated among Arabic and Swahili caravan leaders of people going missing overnight with no clues to where they had gone and their packs left behind. Initial laying of groundworks for the rail had just reached the western side of the river when the first disappearances were noted by British engineers. Ronald O. Preston, the railhead engineer in 1897, noted that a loincloth was found on the edge of the river, but the man it belonged to was nowhere to be found. His remains were discovered later. His whole body, save his feet and head, were defleshed. Lion paw prints, called pug marks, were found all around the remains. It appeared the mysterious disappearances were due to a man-eating lion. Preston was disturbed. He and the Indian workers built bomas, or stockades, from thorny bushes around their tents. The next morning, he and several other men searched for the lion, intent on killing it. They found no lion, but they did discover more human remains, proof that the lion had been doing this for some time. When another man was lost, panic began to spread. Preston and the workers frantically proceeded with construction so they could get out of the area. Before they had finished, 16 Punjabi workmen and one Punjabi headman had been killed. After the camp had been packed up and moved further down the route to continue construction, Preston returned to the river and was greeted by a man waving at him frantically from a treetop. It was a Greek contractor who had been finishing up his work. His tent at the base of the tree was in ruins. He said a lion had attacked at night, pulling his mattress out of the tent. He had only just escaped by climbing the tree. Unfortunately, this was only the beginning. The same incidents and more that occurred during the laying of the permanent track were recorded by John Henry Patterson, who arrived at the Savo camp on March 8, 1898. Patterson was a British civil engineer and a lieutenant colonel who had just finished service in India. His task was to complete the permanent fixtures of the rail within 30 miles of the Savo River and the bridge over the river itself. Before we get into Patterson's account and the struggle with the man-eating lions of Savo, let's pause for a word from our sponsors. In celebration of the return of the Morbid Curiosity podcast and the enthusiasm of the creepy community for poisonous plants, the MCP is giving away four copies of Strange Horticulture, the new occult puzzle game from Bad Viking and Iceberg Games. You play the owner of a local horticulturist shop. The goals include finding and identifying new plants, petting your cat, working with local witches and an apocalyptic cult, all while using your collection of strange and dangerous plants to influence the story and unravel the dark mysteries of the city of Undermere. 
I've played through the game twice already, making different decisions each time, and both endings were epic. I hear there are more than two, so I'd love to play it again. I really enjoyed adventuring out to find new plants, using clues to identify them, and then using them to help or hinder the people who came into my shop. Now that this episode is live, so is the giveaway. To enter, go to one or all of our social media outlets, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, and follow the directions of the giveaway post on each page. You can only enter once on each platform, otherwise you'll be disqualified. Patrons of the MCP get an extra opportunity to win on the MCP Discord server, which is accessible by joining the MCP Patreon community at any level. Winners will be drawn on May 9th and will receive a direct message with a game code for Strange Horticulture, redeemable on Steam. Thank you to Bad Viking and Iceberg Games for giving us this opportunity, and thank you, creepy community, for sticking with us. We really appreciate you all. Thank you. Our regular sponsor is Audible.com. Audible can provide you with interesting and engaging audiobooks. In fact, there are over 180,000 of them to choose from, which you can listen to on your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or other MP3 players. MCP listeners can get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial of Audible.com by going to www.audibletrial.com MCP. You can also find this link on our Facebook page and website. If you sign up for the free trial, you get a free audiobook that is yours to keep, even if you cancel the service as soon as you finish downloading it. And the MCP gets the funding it needs to keep bringing morbid history to your ears. So go get your free audiobook on us. Lastly, if you like this podcast, why not sponsor the MCP yourself by becoming a patron on Patreon? Over 45,000 people download this podcast every month, but only around 140 people are supporting us on Patreon. For a mere dollar an episode, that's $2 a month, you can get ad-free episodes, bonus behind-the-scenes info, give your opinion by answering polls, have access to all the horror story readings, and get updates on past episodes. For $3 an episode, you get monthly outtake reels. For $5, you get a monthly quiz episode, where I quiz my husband on past episodes. For $10, you get a detailed bibliography of all the resources I've used while researching an episode. And for $20, you get a bit of miscellaneous morbidity, a short essay on a random morbid topic every month. Previously, we have reviewed horror video games and television shows, discussed the plague pits of London, and tried out historic recipes from previous episodes. All of these rewards aside, your patronage supports the podcast and keeps new episodes coming. I can't keep doing this podcast without you, so go to bit.ly slash morbidpatron, that's b-i-t dot l-y slash morbidpatron, to choose your rewards and support the MCP. You'll have my eternal gratitude. And now, back to the podcast. Before we get into Patterson's account, it's important to note that it was written for a specific audience, the British upper echelon, who, since the Victorian era, were obsessed with the mythos of quote-unquote wild Africa, but had no real knowledge of the continent or its people. Most thought of it as a savage, uncivilized place in need of guidance by the civilized, superior British. Because of this colonial mindset, Patterson's account is peppered with racist and belittling language and self-promotion. It does, however, contain the most detailed account of the events, albeit somewhat embellished. If you read it, just be prepared for that. Savo Camp had a complicated social setting as well. Many distinct ethnicities were present, including some that were intolerant of each other. Patterson relates issues between Muslim and Hindu workers, indigenous peoples and Indian immigrants, and many other social issues amongst the workers. It was in this already complex setting that attacks became more frequent. At first, when the incidents recorded by Preston were relayed to Patterson, Patterson didn't believe them. However, days after his arrival, another man went missing, sparking more panic. At the time, Savo Camp had around 3,000 people working and living in it. Tents were dotted along the track for miles on either side of the Savo River, so what happened in one part of the camp wasn't always observed in other parts. A few nights later, 
Ungin Singh, a Jemadar or Indian lieutenant, was brutally killed in the night. His tentmates said that around midnight, a lion's head came through the open tent and seized the throat of the nearest man, Singh. Singh gave a single cry, then was silent as he was dragged out of the tent. The next morning, Patterson and camp veterinarian J.A. Haslam followed the drag marks and blood and soon discovered Singh's body. It had been torn apart, the skin seemingly licked off and sucked dry of blood. Only his head remained mostly intact, punctured by tooth marks. Patterson noted a look of horror on Singh's face. They returned to camp with the head so it could be officially identified by the camp doctor. Terror settled over Savo camp. Tents were consolidated, and large bomas were constructed around groups of tents. Machans, elevated platforms made of wood, were set up at the scene of Singh's death and other locations around the camp. Livestock, either live or already dead due to disease, were used as bait while men waited on the Machans for the chance to shoot the beast. However, the lion did not appear. Two or three days later, another two men were mauled. Patterson had been up waiting for the lions with his rifle at the scene of the last incident. He heard the cries of the men, but was too far away to see the lion. Patterson was determined. He set more traps, laced animal remains with strychnine, and stayed up most nights hoping to shoot what he thought was a single lion. It was soon apparent that it was not a single lion, but two, and neither cared for dead animals. The lions targeted sleeping humans, stealthily leaping over the bomas and ambushing their prey. One lion went in, made the kill, then fled a little ways away from camp so both could eat. Patterson was always one step behind. It seemed as if they knew where he was, and therefore attacked elsewhere in the camp. Many men believed them possessed, calling them demons or devils. They eluded traps and bullets, and many more men died. However, in late April, the attacks suddenly stopped. Patterson assumed he'd frightened them away, but was still wary. A bounty of between 100 and 200 rupees was set on the lions in July of 1898. Men would be paid for any lion killed within a mile of the rails and five miles on either side of the river. As news of the lions had reached Europe, many European big game hunters came to try their luck, but none stayed long as the lions were nowhere to be found. During this time of relative peace, works continued and calm settled over the camp. Tents spaced out again, and many people slept outside to catch the breeze at night as the days were blisteringly hot. A drought had hit the area hard. In September, a group of workers planned to mutiny against Patterson, who was a strict leader. The mutiny failed when loyal workers alerted him before it could move forward. Then, in November, the attacks began again. This time, the lions seemed to have no fear. They both ambushed sleeping men and pulled them through the thorny bomas, and then began eating right outside the barriers. They often ignored the shots fired at them as they ate. There were so many attacks that dusk brought dread to the entire camp. Roars announced their presence, and the silence that followed was not a sign of safety. The belief that the lions were demons flourished throughout the camp. Patterson tried every night to ambush the lions, and every night he failed. He had several close calls himself, the stealthy lions surprising him by appearing under his machin in the dark. Workers began sleeping in trees for safety. Then, on December 9th, Patterson was able to shoot one of the lions, first in the thigh and then in the neck. At dawn, he approached where it lay, still cautious in case it was only injured. The lion, which was covered in scars and scratches from pushing through the bomas, was indeed dead. The next night, the second lion attacked, but failed to kill anyone. Determined, the night after, Patterson tied three live goats to a 250-pound rail beam, then hid in a hunting blind. Just before dawn, the lion seized one of the goats and dragged it, the other two goats, and the rail into the bush. Patterson was able to shoot it twice in the shoulder, but it escaped. Ten days passed without incident. Then the lion returned and treed several workers. It managed to destroy their tents but was unable to kill anyone. The very next night, December 28th, Patterson again waited for the lion. He was able to shoot it in the chest. It fled into the bush and he pursued it with a porter. 
He managed to shoot it again, but lost it in the darkness. At dawn, he tracked a trail of blood to the injured lion. It attacked, treeing him and his porter. He was able to shoot it again as it circled the tree, in the leg, then the chest, then the head. The lion fell dead with six bullet holes in its body. The whole camp celebrated, praising Patterson as a hero. Patterson had the lion skinned and turned into rugs to decorate his tent, with the heads and skulls intact. Works on the rail line continued without further lion attacks. The Savo Bridge was completed and the camp eventually moved along with construction. Patterson published his account of the nine-month-long incident in 1907. He referred to it as a reign of terror and stated that about 28 Indian laborers and a large number of indigenous Africans were killed, but that an exact tally was not kept. The reason the deaths of the indigenous African workers were not tallied was that they were paid with things other than money, so the payouts weren't recorded, and neither were their names. Ronald Hardy, in his 1965 review of the incident, stated that there was no official reason to keep track, and at the time, no one cared. Patterson's account became so internationally popular that after serving as a commander of the Jewish Legion during World War I, he toured the world talking about the incident. After speaking at the Chicago Field Museum on November 29, 1924, he mentioned to the curators that he still had the pelts and skulls of the two lions. He offered to sell them to the museum because it was one of his favorites. The lions were acquired by the museum on February 5, 1925. Due to the good condition of the pelts, they were carefully taxidermied back into the shape of lions. The pelts were still covered in scars, and the lack of manes was surprising to most. They also seemed a lot smaller than Patterson had stated in his book. This is likely because the pelts had been trimmed to be rugs and were trimmed again to be stuffed, taking their original size down. In the summary of the incident written for the museum, Patterson stated that 135 people were killed by the lions. The Savo Lions attracted museum patrons for years and are still on display at the Chicago Field Museum, alongside another man-eating lion, which I'll talk about briefly in a moment. Interest in the story has waxed and waned over the years. A film called The Ghost and the Darkness renewed public interest in 1996. The incident has sparked many questions in the scientific community, primarily what makes lions and other predators begin hunting humans. One of the scientists specifically interested in the Lions of Savo is Dr. Bruce D. Patterson, no relation to John Henry Patterson. His team conducted stable isotope analysis on the hides and teeth of the Savo lions to learn about their diets, as well as examined their skulls and teeth both macro and microscopically for hints about why they went after humans. As an adjunct research professor at the Chicago Field Museum, Dr. Patterson currently documents and observes modern Savo lions through a collaborative research program between the Chicago Field Museum, the Kenya Wildlife Services, and the National Museum of Kenya. In 2008, Dr. Patterson and his team analyzed bone collagen from the teeth and keratin from the hair of both Savo lions in order to get a more accurate look at their diets in the months before their deaths. This was done using stable isotope analysis, whereby measuring the ratios of different isotopes in bones or teeth and tracing them back to the sources they originate from, researchers can determine things like diet and the environment which they grew up in. The researchers found that human meat made up 30% of Lion 1's diet and 13% of Lion 2's diet in the months before they died, Lion 1 being the first lion shot and Lion 2 being the second. These percentages are lower than expected and puts the number of humans consumed closer to 35. That's not to say the lions didn't kill 135 people, but they didn't eat all of them. Whether this was due to quick body recovery by the workers or humans not actually being the primary prey is not known. Isotopes also indicated that this wasn't the first instance of these lions consuming human flesh, but that their usual prey was not humans. The isotopes also showed that the lions consumed more soft tissues than bone. This was corroborated by the examination of their teeth. The Savo lion's teeth were worn in a way that more closely matches lions born and raised in zoos. Lions in zoos are fed softer foods and don't often have to deal with bones, while wild-caught lions typically crunch through animal bones to get to the meat and marrow, which leaves markings and wear patterns on their teeth. There were also injuries to the teeth, 
The first lion had a massive dental abscess, an infected broken tooth, and several missing teeth with bone reformation. This suggests it had been living with this infection for a long time, and likely was unable to bite down without pain. The second lion didn't have any infections, though it did have a broken tooth. There are many factors that might contribute to a lion moving to humans as a food source, but according to Dr. Patterson, the most important are the opportunity to do so, the age and health of the lion, and the availability of their usual prey. When compared to a buffalo or wildebeest, humans seem like easy prey for a lion, especially unarmed sleeping humans. And with all the humans moving into the area thanks to the construction of the rails, there were plenty to hunt. It's possible the Savo lions started out eating the corpses of those who died due to famine and disease. Severe drought and famine plagued the Savo area in the 1860s, 1870s, and 1890s. The Mwakasenge famine of the 1890s was horrific. Disease often comes with famine, and new infections were also spread by the railway, smallpox and STIs being the most prevalent. Some Kenyan cultures don't bury the dead, preferring instead to dispose of corpses through exposure or leaving them in the wild to be consumed by animals. In 1898 was the height of all this devastation. Corpses were everywhere, too numerous for the usual scavengers to consume, so other predators became scavengers. The lions likely got used to eating the corpses and lost their fear of live humans as most were too sick to defend themselves. When the supply of corpses dwindled, they moved on to eating sleeping humans, who are just as defenseless as corpses. Another reason the lions hunted humans could be that they weren't able to go after their usual prey due to injury. They'd be desperate for food, even if a drought hadn't decreased their usual prey. While tooth breakage is fairly common in lions and other carnivores due to use in grasping and bone crunching of their prey, long-term infection is not. The first lion had a massive dental abscess, a sure sign of infection in the mouth. It's likely the lion was unable to bite down hard without pain, preventing them from performing the killing bite or eating through the bones of their usual prey. The second lion didn't have an infection, so why was he also hunting humans? Lions are unique among felines in that they are very social. Male and female lions usually belong to long-lasting social groups called prides. While females tend to stay in the same pride they were born in, males tend to leave their birth pride to find unrelated females for breeding purposes. Males generally stay with a pride for about two years before moving on. In that time, they mate, sire young, defend the young until they can defend themselves, and then move on. When leaving their birth pride, male lions often leave with other males, possibly their siblings or cousins, from their original pride. This is called a coalition, and these males will probably stick together for the rest of their lives. They move from pride to pride together, or sometimes rove on their own. It's very likely that the Savo lions were one of these male coalitions that had broken away from a pride. After the injury, Lion 2 stayed with Lion 1 and even switched prey with him. Lion 1 was slightly older than Lion 2, so it's possible Lion 2 was just following his lead. After Lion 1 was shot, the uninjured lion became the main hunter. Apparently, he wasn't as practiced at hunting humans as his partner, because though he tried, he wasn't able to kill many humans after Lion 1 died. While we're on the subject of lion norms, another question often asked is why neither lion had a mane. Most male lions have manes, but the amount of hair and color of the mane is variable. While it's more common for male lions to have huge bushy manes in South Africa, those of Zambia have much smaller, scruffier manes. Most male lions in the Savo area have no manes. Dr. Patterson has studied why this might be and has come up with more questions than answers. The genetic composition of male lions with and without manes appears to be the same, and while geography and elevation may have something to do with it, the exact reason is unknown. Another theory as to why these two lions began eating humans is that their usual prey wasn't available. This could be due to overhunting or natural causes like the drought. Lion diets, behavior, and social groups are highly variable and depend on many factors, including shifts in prey availability and habitat structure. Two decades of exploitation, safaris and big game hunting that drew rich Europeans to the area, had already caused enough devastation to the wildlife in the Savo region that in 1896, the first wildlife reserve was created to preserve the animals and their habitat. 
The last question I'll address is why the lion attacks stopped for a time. Dr. Patterson hypothesizes that while there was peace at the Savo camp from April to November, it's likely the lions were scavenging corpses from the Taita and Kamba villages nearby. The drought and resulting famine had caused mass mortality up and down the river, and while a sleeping human is easy to hunt, a dead one is easier. Another famous man-eating lion is displayed alongside the two Savo lions. This lion is from Mfue, Zambia, and is also maneless. It was part of a string of attacks and killings that occurred in 1991. This male lion, alongside two female lions, killed women, children, and differently abled people from several villages in the area. After the two females were shot, the male continued killing. He seemed fearless and intelligent. It's reported that he once returned to the scene of one of his kills, a woman whom he'd snatched from her own doorstep. On his return, he entered the house, dragged a bag of the woman's laundry out and into the center of town, and stood over it, roaring loudly. This lion was eventually dispatched 20 days after this incident by Wayne Hosek, an American big game hunter. Like Lieutenant Colonel Patterson, he too was hailed as a hero by the people of the area, wrote a book about the hunt, and donated the remains of the lion to the Chicago Field Museum. The Mfue lion also suffered from an infection. His lower jaw had a healed blunt force trauma injury, possibly a kick from a large hooved animal, that shattered part of the jaw. It also seemed to have been dislocated for a time, or at least displaced to accommodate the swelling from the injury. The bone eventually healed over a channel in the jaw, which cut off blood supply and nerves on one side. Hosek said he had seen pus around the jaws, so this injury was infected and very likely painful, just like that of Savo Lion 1. While humans aren't usually the target of large carnivores, there are certain situations that push them to become man-eaters. These situations are stressful for them, times of desperation and persecution, times often caused by the humans they end up eating. It almost seems fitting, but that doesn't stop it from being terrifying and gruesome for both humans and the carnivores. That is why the tale of the Lions of Savo sparks our morbid curiosity. The Morbid Curiosity Podcast was produced by H. Lloyd. If you'd like to get in touch or suggest a morbid topic for me to talk about, you can tweet the show at Morbid Podcast or find us on Facebook and Instagram at Morbid Curiosity Podcast. If you like the show, please share us on social media and please give us a rating on Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast app you use. Your shares and ratings help us expand this wonderfully creepy community. Thank you to everyone who liked, commented, followed, and shared the MCP on social media. A special thank you to Shauna Gonzalez for the books and Minidesk fan. Thank you to everyone who entered the Strange Horticulture video game giveaway. Winners will be drawn at random for each social media platform on May 9th, so hurry up and enter before it's too late. Aileen, Crystal, Danielle, Ashley S., Clementine, Kate, and Penny G all have my eternal gratitude for becoming patrons. Thank you so much. Because of you, the listeners, our creepy community is growing, especially on Facebook, so head over there to engage with other listeners, discuss episodes, suggest topics, and share your own morbid curiosities. The MCP has joined the Straight Up Strange podcast network, which hosts true crime, paranormal, history, science, folklore, and other enigmatic podcasts. Nothing is off limits when you enter the world of Straight Up Strange. The MCP is also part of a wider creepy community known as the Belfry Podcast Network. Check out other shows on the Belfry Network at www.thebelfry.rip. If you want to support the MCP but would rather not become a patron on Patreon, you can give one-time donations by going to our website, www.morbidcuriositypodcast.com, and clicking the Donate button. Also on our website, you'll find links to all our social media, a list of episodes, and other ways to contact us, including our mailing address. Another way to help the show is by visiting our Amazon wishlist at bit.ly slash morbidwishlist. That's B-I-T dot L-Y slash morbidwishlist. Any purchases from this list are greatly appreciated. We are eternally grateful for your support. My name is Hallie, and until next time, thanks for listening.